And the, uh, if you want the title of this message, well, the title of this message would be Entering His Rest. I'm sure that you all know that in uh, the book of Hebrews, book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9, there says that uh, there still remains uh, sabbatismos in Greek, and sabbatismos in Greek is obviously obvious allusion to the Sabbath, which literally does mean the word sabbatismos means uh, literal keeping of the Sabbath for God's people. And uh, now entering his rest, God's rest, of course, you can, as you can well understand, does have a little bit deeper, deeper meaning. And uh, sometimes when you think about all the things we know and understand, my friends, uh, you've really got to make yourself stop and consider all that you have and all that so that we all have been given in terms of knowledge and understanding. And then we look around, you know, we look at the world out there where people desperately struggling without that knowledge and not knowing where they are going. Going. Now, here we have a great sense of purpose, of course, of our lives, of what we believe, and it is a great blessing. Now, we also understand, hopefully, the symbolism of Egypt. Egypt in the Bible uh, symbolically does also represent this present evil world. And we also do understand the land of promise, which today, in our case, represents the God's kingdom. Now, the way of our journey to that kingdom is determined by God. Israel was being brought under the loving hand of God out of Egypt. It was guided into a relationship with him that would exemplify the relationship that God and the Word, the Father and the Son, had uh, in the beginning, as John tells us. Now, God describes this relationship with Israel as being at rest. And uh, his relationship with the word, the Logos, or Jesus Christ, of course, it is also being described as a rest. Now, God wanted to lead his people into a quiet and restful place, which would have the presence of security. Because the Hebrew word for rest carries all of these meanings and even, even more. So, um, all these meanings and even more, and then we're going to indeed see in a minute how this all plays out in our Christian life. Now, you might remember that Israel crossed the Red Sea and they watched this enormous enemy being destroyed, 600 best chariots and all the chariots of Egypt. That's what the scripture says. Now, Josephus, the uh, uh, Hebrew uh, or the Jewish uh, scholar, Jewish Roman scholar, he adds in his uh, report, in his account, of the Red Sea crossing, that uh, the Red Sea covered 50,000 horsemen and 200,000 armed footmen. Uh, you know, quite an impressive army, you wouldn't, wouldn't you say. And they watched that army being destroyed. Now, how does, you know, how did Josephus know all these numbers? I don't really know, but that's what he wrote about the Red Sea crossing. And then as the Israelites turned from the Red Sea, their enemy was behind them. It was obliterated by God, and Mount Sinai and Covenant meeting in front of them was in front of Israelites. And the only thing that stood really between them and the condition of rest with God was themselves. We have a conversation in Exodus chapter 33 that was going on between God and Moses, and Moses and the Lord, oh, they were speaking as though they were very close friends. Exodus 33 and verse 14, he said, My presence will go with you, and I'll give you rest. Now it's uh, Moses and the people of Israel that God is saying he was going to give rest to. Uh, the word nuach, nuach here means rest. So God's presence was absolutely certain, and that's the part of the meaning of that word nuach meaning the rest. And then if you go in Exodus to Exodus chapter 13, now this is all around the, uh, the days of unleavened bread that we keep as the feast every year. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, we read, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. Verse 22, he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So, brethren, you see God's presence was absolutely certain. He was going to be there with the Israelites and he was promising that he would provide new watch, 
rest. And a very powerful example of God's rest is right here. If you go to Exodus 14 and verse 19, again we have the situation of Pharaoh's army drawing near to the children of Israel. And as I said, the size of that army, as uh, if we are to judge by what Josephus gives us, the size of that army was obviously very impressive. Exodus 14, verse 19, And the angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israelites. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. So, you see, brethren, with their own eyes, Israelites witnessed the army coming, and they were desperately afraid of what they were seeing, of course. But God, again, intervened and gave them rest in that particular situation. So God backed up what he has said he would do, and they had the witness of what he was willing to do for them. Then if you go to the book of Isaiah, or Isaiah, how you want to pronounce it anyway, Isaiah or Isaiah chapter 14, we're going to see indeed how God was willing to uh, always provide for his people. He says, for the Lord, Isaiah 14 verse 1, for the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will still choose Israel and settle them in their own land. The strangers will be joined with them and they will cling to the house of Jacob. Then people will take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel will possess them for servants and maids in the land of the Eternal. They will take them captive, whose captives they were, and rule over their oppressors. It shall come to pass in the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow and from your fear and the hard bondage in which you were made to serve. This is, of course, now a prophecy about the second exodus and the Israelites populating again their promised land. But in any way, we see from this passage of Isaiah 14 that God gives rest. Israel seems to have pretty good grasp uh, of that, or will have pretty good grasp. But the book of Isaiah is very interesting because uh, the prophet Isaiah seems to have a pretty good grasp of this concept of rest because he refers to that rest uh, is several different ways throughout his book. For example, in uh, chapter 63 of Isaiah, or Isaiah, chapter 63, we read in verse 7 that it says, I'll mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to, their, to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. So think about these aspects of God's relationship with men from a very personal point of view, the wonderful blessings that have been provided for us. You know, it's God's goodness toward us. When you think about it, you see that God is always willing to give his people rest. Then verse 8, For he said, Surely they are my people, children who will not lie. So he became their savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved him. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But he might say the only, let's call it fly in the ointment, so to speak, the only fly in the ointment here in this relationship and God's obvious desire of rest, peace, stability and security for his people are the people themselves. And obviously I'm going to be, you know, uh, emphasizing that as we go forward. People, they were the problem. Verse 10. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy and he fought against them. Now, of course, that is not what God wanted. He, you know, it wasn't what he had intended, but this is all happening to show us something, to give us something to understand. Verse 11. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people saying, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them? who led them by the right hand of Moses with glorious arm, 
dividing the water before them to make for himself an everlasting name. Verse 13, who led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness, that they might not stumble, as a beast goes down into the valley, and the Spirit of the Lord causes him to rest, so you lead your people to make yourself a glorious name. You see, it says, so you lead your people and cause them to rest. Brethren, our journey is not determined by the surrounding environment in which we live. Our journey can be a journey of rest, or it can be a journey of angst, as we see here. So it's going to depend a lot on how we approach this. Now, the house of Israel is our example in many ways. Their example is actually of a way of doing it without God's Spirit. A lot of what is uh, you know, written in the Bible, in the Old Testament, is actually record of them doing things without God's Holy Spirit. So it's, it remains for us that we can read and understand. You have a group of people unable to come into the rest that God was offering them because they didn't have God's Spirit. Their example reflects decisions, choices, and attitudes that flow from a mind not building a relationship with God. And obviously, you see, the advantage we have is that we do have access to God's Holy Spirit. You know, we can build that relationship and we can come into a rest with Him. Or, better said, rest is in Him, so we can come to a rest in Him. We're in the book of Isaiah still, so if you go to chapter 30, verse 15, Isaiah 30, 15, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. So they saw, you see, they saw the army coming. They could see with their own eyes the vast numbers in that army. They exactly knew where they were positioned. And Moses said to them, Stand still and see the salvation of the Eternal. That the notion of salvation or victory is tied up in the word new watch or rest. Now, maybe a better way to perceive rest is to look at it from God's point of view. In Isaiah 66, verse 1, God is saying, in Isaiah 66, verse 1, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? So he's looking at the creation, you know, the extent of the universe, and God is saying, where is the place of my rest? Well, he could have said, my rest is on my throne in heaven, or my rest is here, or my rest is there. But he said in verse 2, for all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist. So, not my throne in heaven, not the universe. I sit at my throne, I can put my feet on the earth as the footstool to my feet, but this is what's more important to me than anything else. Look at verse 2. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles, trembles at my word. Well, this is the more important than anything else. You see, this is where God is getting us to, brethren, bringing us to this frame of mind so that he can enter into a rest with his people. This is God's perspective. And we need to think of this from God's perspective from time to time because there are a lot of conditions around us in this world that are not restful. But God is offering us what? He's offering us rest. He wants to have a relationship with us that is a restful relationship. Now the word rest here truly focuses on security, certainty, being settled, absolutely certain, in contrast to the created universe God desires to make his rest with people who seek his rest as a way of life. You see, God's resting place is with people who reject the leaven, so to speak, of this evil world. Uh, leaven, of course, being the uh, symbolism of sin, as we when we keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So God's resting place is with people who, let's say, overcome sin, and overcome all the all the bad things of this evil world. We see the house of Israel failing to do that. You know, they carried Egypt with them in their hearts and minds, and it is a lesson for us that a life without God's Spirit is a life without God. It is an example of that life without God's Spirit is not going to lead to a restful relationship. 
If you go to Psalm 51, which is a repentant psalm after David committed adultery with Bathsheba, in Psalm 51 verse 9 we see David says, Hide your face from my sins and blot out my, all my iniquities. Now we are talking about blessings and just look at the statement and realize its application for us. There is something that we can ask. Verse 9, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. The God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Well, that is what we have to carry with us as we go on this journey that God is taking us on. Just as he led the house of Israel to the land of promise, he is now leading us to the land of promise, the kingdom of God. And he is looking for the sacrifices of a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart, because, brethren, that is not typical and natural in human life in this world. In fact, it is totally unnatural in that case, but we have the opportunity to develop this mindset and to carry it forward. The Holy Spirit will produce a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart in a very positive sense if we will use it accordingly. As we proceed in our journey, we need to keep God's intent in mind. If you go back to Exodus chapter 13, and we're going to clearly see that the seven days of unleavened bread and no leavened bread to be among us in our quarters, that's written in uh, Exodus 13, verse 6 and 7, but that comes verse 8. Exodus 13, 8. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. He shall be a sign to you on your hand, and as a memorial between your eyes, that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You see? When it says a sign on your hand and memorial between your eyes, means mind. What is between our eyes is mind. And you also remember that this is a sign that is being accepted uh, voluntarily. Opposite of that sign of God's law is the mark that is being pushed upon people, imposed on people, if you wish, by force, the mark of the beast. Verse 16, it shall be a sign on your hand and, a f and as frontlets between your eyes, for by strength of hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So, you see, brethren, the Lord's law shall be in our mouth. It has to be with us continually. It has to be the way we see things, you know. It has to be a result of the things we do, the hand and the mind. Because the point is, in Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, the point is Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Verse 7, uh, You shall teach them diligently to your children. Exactly. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your, on your hand. And they shall be a frontlets between your eyes. Now, brethren, frankly, you could do that, and you could do that, uh, you know, all that as a ritual and not change the heart or the mind one yota. It has to do with the internal workings of our minds and our hearts, that God's law is the way we see things. You see, when you view something, you must view it through the lens of God's law. When we do something, it needs to be driven by the motive of God's law. Then in Deuteronomy, we're still, if you can just go to chapter 11, Deuteronomy chapter 11, 
verse 18. Therefore you should lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Verse 20, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So when you leave your house, you leave with a perspective of God's law in mind. When you return to your house, you return with a perspective of God's law being taken into your house, to your family and to your children. Because God's law is everything, brethren. and it has to be for us. How much time do you spend thinking about what you see in the world around us and analyzing it from the point of view of God's law. Now, God's law is to be a part of our mentality in thought and in action. And as we look around the world and we see these things happening, you wonder, what is the foundation? Well, foundation it is not God. It is not morality based on even a close alliance with Christian values. It's all crumbling, it's all disappearing, and we are seeing the result around us. God has called us to live in this world, to be a part of it, but to represent a way of life where God's law is the daily, basic, basic daily substance. That is a foundation. Now in Deuteronomy, if you go to chapter 12, and let's see verse 8 and 9, Deuteronomy 12, verse 8, you shall not at all do as was as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. For as you, as yet you have not come to the, say, to the rest and the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. So it says we have to deal with every man doing what, it is, what is right in his own eyes as an environment in which we live, but we have got to keep our eyes on the rest. We can have an internal rest in our relationship with God. You know, God is taking us to a true rest to be a witness and an example to this world. Like the house of Israel, we have departed, but we have not yet arrived. And we are on this journey, and God is mapping that journey out for us. Now, our defense against uh, every man doing what is right in his own eyes, attitude, our defense against that attitude is God's law between our eyes and upon our hands. Looking at our lives, looking at our families from the point of view of God's law, writing it deep in, on our hearts, are we going to try to do that more? I hope we will. Because God's law brings us into rest with God. There is no rest in the world. We cannot produce rest of ourselves. True rest comes from our relationship with God. And the more we overcome sin, the greater the rest we will have. In this world that doesn't the world that doesn't know rest, we can be at rest in ourselves, in our relationship with God, we can be at peace. Now the the prophet Micah puts it this way Micah two verse ten Arise and depart for this is not your rest. Arise and depart, for this is not your rest, because it is defiled, it shall, dis it shall destroy, yes, with utter destruction. And the closer we draw to this world in terms of attitude, in terms of frame of mind, the less rest we will have. Because God has a rest for his people, brethren, and this world is not that rest, certainly. If you go please to Psalm 95, Oh, come and let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Eternal, or Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His frame. Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, you know, when Israel did harden their hearts. And again, that's an example for us to use. God's Spirit, to soften our hearts, to be contrite, to be open, to be humble. Verse 9, when, you, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years 
I was grieved with that generation and said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my, my ways. So I saw in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now this is a written example for us. Again, a group of them did not enter into the rest because of the hardness of their hearts. Now we live in an environment, brethren, that will harden our hearts very, very quickly if we allow that. If we don't use the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God to keep a humble heart, open to being taught and learning, taking God's law and applying it. Now God's law that we applied this year can be applied with much deeper understanding, I would think, because that is the nature of how God's law works with Holy with his Holy Spirit. What we understand at this point in time, as we go forward with a right attitude, we will understand more and more and more, continually growing and coming into a deeper and deeper sense of rest with God. Now, the wording is familiar, you know, in the book of Hebrews, but uh, it makes it very personal to us when Paul repeats this here in Hebrews uh, in Hebrews 3 verse 12 beware so he is you know calling your attention beware brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God now Satan is our enemy I don't know how many times I would need to point it out that he doesn't sleep and he is not wanting to uh, all of us he is not wanting to enter into a rest. Satan doesn't want you nor me to be at peace, to feel secure, to feel strong in our relationship with, my, with God. Satan wants us to be disturbed. Satan wants us to be stressed, worried, anxious. And so the environment around us will very quickly turn our hearts into a heart of belief if we are not watching carefully. Verse 13. But exhort, it, exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we, are become, we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Indeed, we have been called, we have been led through the Red Sea of Baptism, and we are now in a relationship with God. We have that confidence of baptism, and we take it forward and then in verse 15 while it is said today if you will hear his voice do not harden your hearts in the rebellion for who having heard rebelled indeed was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses now with whom was he angry 40 years was it not with those who sinned whose corpses fell in the wilderness and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of, because of unbelief. Yes, brethren, it is uh, uh, because of unbelief. Uh, it is possible that we can fall short of entering his rest because we have a powerful force. Uh, around us that uh, basically basically wants us wants us to fall short of entering that rest Hebrews 4 verse 3 Hebrews 4 verse 3 uh, let's read verse 3 okay for he, for we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said so I saw in my wrath they shall not enter my rest although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Now the Sabbath play now comes, uh, the Sabbath day comes into play in the sense of a type of the rest that God is offering us when we come into that relationship. One day in seven, to remind us of the rest relationship God is offering us. Verse 6 says, Therefore, it remains that some must enter it, 
and those to whom it was preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, verse 7, he, de he uh, designs a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, as it, uh, as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest, his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God, as God did from his. So, brethren, we put, you know, as we did in summer, unleavened bread out of our dwellings. We did not eat of anything with leaven. We leaven in it, you know, for seven days to remind ourselves of this, of ceasing from our works and embracing the seventh day rest as a type of a great rest to come. Verse 11, let us therefore be diligent to enter the rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience, for the word of God is living and powerful. Oh, but the word of God is alive, it's real. God's word brought to life by the Spirit of God is reality. This world is not. So the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than uh, any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and of joints and marrow, and is a disaster is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, do we use the spirit that way? Do we look at it uh, in that sense? And do we use it? And sometimes, as we have occasion to do leading up to the Passover, do we examine ourselves intensely, examine our personal relationship with God? Sometimes the word can cut. Sometimes it can pierce. But it's all for good. Now, it is for bringing a group of people into a rest with God. And as we read from Isaiah, read from Isaiah, that's what God wants. The attitude can, um, the attitude of, I can have this entire creation, I made it all, but what I want is you. That's his attitude. He wants, you know, he says he wants you in the right attitude and a right frame of mind. That's more important to me than anything else, God said. Verse 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, our former journey needs to build, it needs to be filled with direction and purpose. Are our eyes on the rest that God is offering us, on that rest that he wants us to have? Using the law as a sign on our hands and a memorial between our eyes, it will justify naturally separate, will just naturally separate us from the effects and directions of spiritual Egypt. If we embrace God's law, if we take it to take the positive approach here, that it in itself is not that uh, it, it's simply not that uh, you've got to get into a great contest here to continue to escape from the draw of Egypt. Embrace God's law and it will naturally lead you, your mind, into a deeper appreciation of what's going on around you. You'll see clearly. clearly. You'll see it clearly. You, you'll know what, what, what to avoid. It'll keep... Egypt at our backs and keep a focus on the rest that lies before us before God's because God's law produces reality and spiritual reality is reality if you go in first Peter chapter 1 first Peter chapter 1 
and verse 3. And blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And verse 4. No, let me see. Is it verse 4 or uh, let's go rather to Psalm 46. Uh, verse Peter, it says, Resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 4, to the inheritance, Peter 1 and verse 4, to the inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Well, Israel failed. They didn't have faith to obey because it, they didn't have God's Holy Spirit. Well, again, I'm not pointing figure. What I'm trying to achieve is learning the lesson how much we need Holy Spirit and to use that Spirit to embrace God's law, God's law and make that law living to make it alive. Uh, so, not just a set of 10 points to hang up on the wall. We need to make that internet intent. You know, the intent of God's mind, a part of who and what we are. Now, the power of God in a human in a human mind. Anyway, the power of God in a human life fills the vacuum created by the spiritual void in this world. You know, uh, if we have the Spirit of God, we can fill that void because Satan doesn't allow a vacuum to exist. He will use a vacuum if it is created, and we have a living hope of an inheritance, and God can bring that hope alive. Uh, please let's look at Psalm 46, because there is a great encouragement within that psalm. It's a psalm that we don't have a great deal of difficulty to equate with our environment today, because the first verse in that psalm says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So like the Israelites looking at the advancing Egyptian army, there is trouble. This environment in which we live produces trouble, it's not rest. Verse 2, therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Now whether it is any number of factors that we can analyze in this world, the world is in turmoil, brethren, and it's in upheaval. And God says, I'm very present help in trouble. I am never far away from you. Verse 4. There is the river whose streams shake, uh, shall make glad the city of God. Now, of course, we know that river is out of Revelation 22. Revelation 22, verse 1. A pure river of water life, of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. Now, if you go to um, Psalm 46, verse 4, it says, There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. 
The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolation in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots in the fire. Be still. Verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. Be still, you see. Now you remember that Moses told the Israelites, be still and see the salvation of the eternal. They didn't have God's Holy Spirit. They were calm for a very short period of time while things went their way. And as soon as adversity came, they were not still anymore. God is telling us, be still and providing the way to be still. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. Verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. Uh, the God of Jacob is our refuge. As it says here, you see, the Elohim of Jacob, or the Lord of hosts uh, is with Jacob, with Jacob our refuge. The family of God is our refuge. But as we continue to live life of overcoming, we can have faith that God is with us, no matter the circumstances, and we do have to remain ourselves of that, because sometimes it doesn't appear that obvious. Indeed, God is there. Be still, be at rest with God. He wants us to be at rest with us. He wants us to be uh, at rest with us. He wants to be at rest with us. And He will offer us rest with Him. Now, God has drawn us, whether you're aware of that or not, He has, draw, he has drawn us out from uh, will not, out from circumstances that will not continue forever you see uh, God will provide rest for his people no matter the physical circumstances Israel did not enter God's rest wandering off into the wilderness for 40 years demonstrating of course the need for God's Holy Spirit and uh, the, the, the need for the Holy Spirit to provide the, the power of, the power of God through faith for salvation. We need to do things we know to do as we go forward on this journey to stay close to that source of power, the power of God through faith for Abraham. Uh, as you see, we have kept faithfully all the holidays and we also we also uh, have got, we have kept earlier, this is now uh, uh, summer now, but earlier in spring, we kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, uh, now let's remember where God's rest is. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus says the high and the lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. But notice who is important to God, friends. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who, set, who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Well, you see, that's the rest that God, God looks for, that he wants to enter into, let his determine to provide God a place for him to rest. A contrite and humble heart, humble spirit. We've got to work to do it that, that there. But we have got the tools to do it as well. So as we go forward here, let us keep our backs to Egyptian and Egypt and let's keep our faces towards the promise of entertaining of entering, sorry, his rest.